Es para nosotros un honor recibir en el día de hoy a la doctora Natalia Holmes, por primera vez en Uruguay, aunque sea en este modo virtual, quien nos va a ofrecer la conferencia titulada Desafíos y oportunidades de los laboratorios introductorios de física. La doctora Natalia Holmes es profesora asistente en el Departamento de Física de la Universidad de Cornell, Recibió con honores su licenciatura en física en la Universidad de Guelph y su maestría y doctorado en física en la Universidad de Columbia Británica. Realizó su postdoctorado en la Universidad de Stanford con el doctor Carl Riemann, premio Nobel de física en el 2001. El grupo de investigación de la doctora Holmes se dedica a múltiples aspectos del aprendizaje, las actitudes y el desarrollo de habilidades de los estudiantes a partir de experiencias prácticas de laboratorio enfocándose en el pensamiento crítico y la experimentación. También explora cuestiones de equidad y diversidad en física y cuestiones metodológicas y técnicas en la investigación y la enseñanza de la física. A modo de introducción sobre esta conferencia de hoy, la doctora Holmes nos cuenta que cuando le preguntamos a los físicos que reflexionen sobre sus laboratorios introductorios, las respuestas suelen incluir expresiones como aburridos, olvida, olvidables o recetas de cocina. Entonces la pregunta que surge es, ¿qué es lo que está tan mal en los laboratorios tradicionales? Una respuesta instintiva es que el problema está en la estructura, es decir, que los estudiantes siguen los procedimientos sin tener que pensar en lo que está ocurriendo. En la conferencia de, del día de hoy, la doctora Holmes nos presentará un trabajo de investigación que desafía esta respuesta instintiva y nos presentará algunas respuestas alternativas y posibles soluciones. Esta conferencia es la última del seminario virtual sobre investigación en ciencia de la física, que incluyó dos actividades previas, un taller sobre Modeling Instruction y una conferencia de la doctora Eugenia Etkina. El seminario ha sido posible gracias a la financiación de la Agencia Nacional de Investigación e Innovación, ANI, y se realiza en el marco del proyecto ANI, Fondo Sectorial de Educación, CFE Investiga, número 157.320, que se titula conociendo e incidiendo sobre las concepciones epistemológicas de los futuros profesores de física, integrado por Álvaro Suárez, Daniel Bachino, Martín Monteiro y Arturo Martí. Ahora sí, damos paso a la conferencia y al final de la misma tendremos un espacio para preguntas. Muy bienvenida Natalia, gracias por estar con nosotros. El auditorio es todo tuyo. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, let me, oh, it looks like I need permission to share the screen. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, and I will do my best to speak as slowly as I can. Um, I usually talk very fast. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanted to first of all say I was supposed to come and speak with you in September, um, but was pleasantly surprised by the early arrival of my son, Calvin. This is Calvin. He is now six months old. Um, and you may hear him in the background as he goes down for a nap at some point, but hopefully he won't interrupt us, um, even though he's adorable. <laughs> So I, um, as was stated in the introduction, I'm an assistant professor at Cornell University and have been building a physics education research group here at the university. And so many people um, pictured here, as well as others who have already come and gone from our group um, have been involved in the work that I'll discuss today. Um, I just wanna acknowledge their contributions as well. So um, to get us started, Um, I'm actually not going to do the poll. Um, I just sort of want you to think to yourself, thinking back on your own experiences as um, physics students, what would you say, you know, if you were to think your intro physics labs were something, sort of what would be the first sort of words that come to mind um, as you think back to your experience? In conversations that I've had with physics teachers, um, around the world, they've all, you know, there's a wide range of experiences. And so I've tried to sort of collect examples of this. And so I posted this question on Twitter um, a number of years ago and put everyone's responses into a word cloud. So the size of the word represents how often it came up in people's responses. Um, and this is what they give me. So the biggest word in the middle is forgettable. These 
um, experiences are just they happen and people try to sort of for either try to forget about them or just um, it sort of leaves their minds. But there's a lot of other stuff in here. So things about learning, um, a lot of labs actually being non-existent, which is an, a challenge, um, useful, uh, but then my favorite that comes up together, pretty tedious, <laughs> which I think um, can be quite familiar to a lot of folks. So to understand sort of this range of experiences that go from you know, both the very good and the very bad, um, what I wanna sort of focus on is when it is when intro labs are particularly negative. Um, and often it comes from experiences where people have been doing what we call traditional physics labs that have um, two key features. They are highly structured and they are confirmatory. And so um, usually these traditional labs have an explicit learning goal to use the experiments to reinforce or demonstrate particular physics concepts. The idea being that students will learn the physics ideas better by seeing it play out in the real world um, with the students having their hands on the experiments themselves. Um, so for example, what this might look like, don't worry about all of this text. This is um, text from a Atwood's machine lab that I would call a fairly traditional set of lab instructions. And to highlight a couple of words, so they're told what equipment they're using. You're using pulleys, rulers, and stopwatches to build an Atwoods machine. Um, they're told what to do. So pick a pair of masses, drop the larger mass, use a stopwatch, drop it three times, repeat for seven mass pairs, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the decisions that an experimenter would have to make as they were designing this and conducting this experiment are all laid out in advance for the students. So the students don't have to do any sort of decision-making themselves, they just follow the instructions. The other piece is this idea of confirmatory. And again, the goal of these labs is for students to learn a particular physics concept. And so here they're told we're doing Atwood's Machines labs. And at the end of it, they're told in their analysis, the slope should equal acceleration due to gravity and the intercept should be close to zero. So they're told right away what the answer, what result they're supposed to get from their experiment. And this of course is necessary when the goal is to demonstrate a particular physics concept, the students should know sort of what they're supposed to get. The idea is to see a particular outcome. And so when I started doing research in physics education, studying labs, I was convinced that the structure was the biggest problem. I had this perception that students could follow the lab sort of without their brains turned on, just follow the instructions sort of blindly. But research, our research has sort of revealed that this is actually not necessarily the case and that the confirmatory piece may actually be more problematic. And I'll show some evidence um, to suggest that. But first I wanna talk about um, what is so, why do we think that these traditional labs are problematic to begin with? And so our first big idea, uh, and there will be three, is that traditional labs do not support student learning of concepts, development of critical thinking skills, or their attitudes towards experimental physics. So let's talk about each of these in turn. So a number of years ago, we did a series of studies where we asked the question, does taking one of these traditional labs that's designed to reinforce sort of conceptual physics material, do those labs actually improve student understanding of that material? And we had a number of institutions um, in the United States where the lab course was optional, even though it was intended to supplement the lecture material, it was sort of this optional add-on to the labs. And so we had a group of students who take the lab and a group of students who don't take the lab and we can directly compare uh, whether there is any sort of added benefit to taking the lab on their exam performance. Now, of course, because it's optional, there are some selection biases in which students opt to take the lab and which don't, which we had to account for in the analysis. Um, but doing that accounting, we um, ended up calculating what we called an average lab benefit, which basically looks at um, 
you know, comparing the two groups of students and controlling for their performance on exam questions that didn't have any lab um, activities supporting them, you can look at whether, um, so a positive average lab benefit is going to be that the students taking the lab had a sort of added value um, in terms of their understanding and their exam performance. Whereas a negative average lab benefit will mean that the lab actually hurt their performance um, compared to the other students. And zero would mean there's no difference between these two groups of students in terms of this added value. Um, so you can think to yourself for a moment, and maybe I've already given the answer, but what might you expect for students having you know, extra time on task, um, exploring the physics material in this hands-on way? Would you expect the average lab benefit to be um, positive? So um, actually help their understanding. Would you expect it to maybe just be small but positive? Um, approximately zero, so there's no benefit. Less than zero, maybe the lab actually hurts their learning. Or we carried this out in um, nine different courses at three different schools, so maybe there's some variability between these institutions. So I'll let you think to yourself for a moment. Okay, so this is the result that we end up with. So across the institutions within error bars in each case, there is no measurable added value to reinforcing this course material um, across the board, which may or may not be surprising to you. I think uh, we were expecting maybe a small benefit, um, but it was sort of remarkable that within error bars, it really was just sort of nothing. The other piece then um, that we looked at is, you know, people often say that just exposure to the experiments is helpful in terms of understanding experimental physics. So um, we've been working with Heather Lewandowski and this is um, work led by one of my grad students, former grad students, Cole Walsh, um, where we looked at student responses on two physics lab specific surveys, the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey for Experimental Physics, the E-class, and the Physics Lab Inventory of Critical Thinking, the PLIC. So the E-class gives students um, statements about experimental physics and asks whether they agree or disagree with those statements and then compares to what an expert would say. So for example, um, understanding uncertainty is helpful for understanding the experiment and an expert would say, yes, that is, um, I agree with that statement. Um, so you look at whether the students agree or disagree. Um, the PLIC, uh, our uh, critical thinking assessment, gives students scenarios of physicists doing a physics experiment um, and asks the students to evaluate the data, evaluate the models, and propose next steps for these groups in the investigation. So these two surveys measure slightly different things, but related specifically to this experimental side of physics. <clears throat> and they've been distributed to over 20,000 students around the world. And when we give these to the instructors to give to their students, we ask the instructors um, what the primary goal of their lab is. So is it to reinforce concepts from lecture as in these traditional labs? Is it to develop lab skills exclusively? Or is it to do a mixture of both? And so then we can sort of parse out the differences between those. Okay. And so what we find, these are the E-class scores, and these are the PLIC scores at the end of instruction, um, depending on whether they're in these concepts-based labs, these skills-based labs, or both. And in each case, we see this sort of increasing function um, where the students in the skills-based labs perform higher than students in these concepts-based labs, um, and even higher than if they're trying to do both. And we even can disentangle this by um, students' gender and students' race ethnic ethnicity. Um, and we find that the pattern holds across um, the demographics. So students always do better in these skills-based labs than in these concept-based labs. Okay. And so this is sort of a, this is the sort of starting point for starting to think about what's going on here. So um, first of all, we saw the traditional labs don't seem to add what we call measurable added value to learning the physics concepts beyond what's already happening in other parts of the course. And when students are in these traditional um, concepts-focused labs, they respond less expert-like to these ideas about um, 
experimental physics, and they score lower on this critical thinking assessment. And so the next set of work that I'll talk about is sort of what is responsible, what is the mechanism um, for these results, particularly the last two. Okay. <clears throat> so um, as I said, I thought it was the structure, but it turns out that our big idea number two is actually that the idea of confirmation is going to conflict with um, teaching authentic experimentation. And this is sort of the big, big idea. So to demonstrate this, I'll describe one of the labs that we do in our physics mechanics, our introductory um, mechanics courses is a um, experiment where students are testing the amplitude dependence, angle dependence of the period of a pendulum. So we ask the students to measure the period when released from 10 degrees and when released from 20 degrees and compare them. And the equation that they see in class is that the period should only depend on the length of the pendulum, not on the amplitude. So they come into it expecting that these they should measure the same period in these two cases. Now, we know that there's a small angle approximation that gives us this formula. And so there actually is an angle dependence, but it's very, very small. And um, with a typical pendulum, it's about 0.02 seconds in our labs. And so if you have a reaction time with a stopwatch uncertainty of about 0.1 seconds, then just letting that pendulum swing 10 times between each start and stop of the pendulum can give you um, precision down at 0.01 seconds. So they can actually measure that difference fairly easily. And so we do experiments, we sort of set up this lab, um, encouraging the students to find ways to reduce their uncertainty so that they can probe this more deeply as they get their uncertainty smaller, they should see that these are starting to look different. However, in the research that we've done, every time we implement this, fewer than about 10% of the students will actually be able to distinguish these two periods um, in our labs. Lots of reasons why, um, but here, for example, is a conclusion from a student in one of these labs. And at the beginning, they say the opposite of the expected happened, the measured values are different. And their conclusion is that the period of a pendulum does depend on the angle with the vertical in the initial position. The formula, the period is two pi root L over G, is only valid for small angles. Considering the results of this experiment, 20 degrees is obviously not small enough. Um, and if you can make a precise enough measurement, you can show that the derivation of the equation um, is just a good approximation and reality is slightly more complicated. And so this student clearly had a grasp on the small angle approximation and how that relates to the precision, um, which is a wonderful conclusion, but they still came into the experiment expecting that the periods would be the same. And why that is, is unclear. <laughs> um, but when I've interviewed students about this, this expectation um, turns out to be very important in how they engage in the lab. So in an interview at the end of the year with another student, um, they told me, the pendulum experiment we did at the beginning of the year, I think that really made a mark on me because I went in there expecting the period at 10 and 20 degrees to be the same because that's what I was taught. And then when you finally figure out, oh, it's supposed to be different, then I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing experiments with bias going in. And so we've started investigating this bias um, that the students seem to have. And I'm gonna sort of share a quick story of two students doing this period of a pendulum lab um, to talk about how this sort of impacts their behaviors in the lab. So the two students, Ali and Ben, go into this pendulum lab expecting um, that the purpose of the lab is actually to show that the model holds true, that the pendulum period doesn't depend on the angle. So one of them says, I was thinking we should do two different angles because I was kind of writing the pre-lab up with the sense that the purpose of the lab was to prove that the period is not affected by the angle. So they're setting out specifically to prove that the angle doesn't matter. And this frame restricts sort of um, the scope of the experiment that they conduct. So we give them a fair bit of flexibility in how they run their experiment, um, but this expectation seems to kind of constrain that. 
For example, one of the students asks, should we do a third degree? Should we add a third angle to our investigation? Probably not. And the other student says no, because they're going just going to be the same. So they've already assumed the outcome of their experiment before they've even done it. Our instructors um, know that students are going to have these kinds of behaviors and they try to push the students um, along the direction of, you know, maybe something might matter here, but the students basically ignore him. So he says, this is a theoretical equation, right? Are there any things that might make them distinguishable? And the other student says, I was thinking maybe the angle of view, which to me is sort of a throwaway, um, just some sort of human error thing. Um, the students, uh, the instructor does get the students to find ways to get their uncertainty smaller, sort of leaning on the idea that once their uncertainty is smaller, they should um, start to see some differences. But the students get frustrated. So another student from another group comes over and asks, how's your T prime value? Um, and T prime is this index that we have the students use to um, quantitatively compare two measurements within uncertainties. So if you have two measurements A and B with their uncertainties, um, this is sort of the, the ratio of the difference between the two measurements in units of uncertainty. So in particle physics, it would be like a, a two sigma or a five sigma effect is sort of what they're um, trying to measure. So <clears throat> as their uncertainties get smaller, these numbers start to look more different. That T prime gets bigger, which means that their measurements are more different. So the student responds, kind of a pain in the butt. Ours was great, but the instructor was like, why don't you try to make it better? So we start making it better and it just gets worse because they're now seeing as they're uncertainly smaller that these are more and more different, which makes him very frustrated. <laughs> and so ultimately then this leads them to engage in what we call questionable research practices. So the students have found this great way to reduce their uncertainty. Um, and by doing so, these periods are looking more and more different. And so they actually decide to go back to just single swings where their uncertainty was larger so that things look more similar. So they say, we'll see if a greater range, i.e. a greater uncertainty will help or hurt our data. Ooh, I like the T prime. The standard deviations are like an order of magnitude higher. So they are very happy to have this large uncertainty so that these measurements look the same. Um, and we've seen these behaviors, not just um, in the video of students interacting, but even in the lab notes that the students submit to be graded by the instructor. So for example, students have written things like, we'll now try to be more precise by recording 10 consecutive periods so that the periods are more alike, really trying explicitly to get these things to look the same. Um, another group says, based on our results, our values were possibly different. They're starting to see this T prime or this difference. However, considering the unreasonably low uncertainty, it is believed that our values were probably not different. Therefore, we tried using 0.02 seconds as our uncertainty, which is larger than what they had. And after doing so, our test statistic is now 0.83, which would prove that our values were probably not different. So this is the classic, if I've got two points with error bars and they sort of disagree, just make those error bars a lot bigger and all of a sudden things agree nicely and we've confirmed the equation. <clears throat> and so when we run this um, pendulum lab, we've seen anywhere from 10 to 60% of student groups will engage in one or more of these um, questionable research practices. Um, and another student in an interview explained sort of where this comes from. So he said, when you realize that there's something wrong with your experiment, if you're just trying to get the result right there and then, well, you get frustrated because it's not working. And then sometimes when those labs, when you don't get the results you want, you're tempted because you know exactly what result you want. So it's tempting to just massage what you've gotten until it looks like something like a distant relative of what you want. And so from this um, sort of series of studies, um, it's become clear that this goal in experiments to obtain a particular answer to verify or confirm textbook theory can lead students to make some questionable decisions during their lab experiments. And this confirmatory goal really conflicts with goals to engage students 
um, in authentic experimentation and, and or, or authentic science. And this is supported by other work, um, for example, survey work that has asked students about sort of the purposes of experiment or the purpose of lab um, and has found that many students believe that the purpose of experiment is just to confirm previously known results rather than to make new discoveries. Um, and that experimental results should be evaluated based on their agreement with theory or previous results, rather than, for example, the uncertainty or the quality of the measurement itself. And so this sets up a really um, problematic sort of tension between trying to use labs to teach conceptual understanding versus um, teaching this sort of authentic physics process. And it's unclear to me that we can do both. Okay. And so then um, there's the other part, um, which is this idea of structure. And as I said, sort of coming into this research, I thought this was the bigger problem. Um, but it turns out that structure is not inherently bad. And I think we know this from lots of other um, education research that shows that students need structure for learning. That sort of makes sense. Um, but let me show you a lab specific study that sort of supports this idea. So we did a study comparing a sort of control condition traditional physics lab that aimed specifically to demonstrate physics principles um, and teach uncertainty and data analysis skills. And we converted that lab into a sort of intervention lab where we're really trying to teach critical thinking skills and engage students in experimental physics. And then we kept um, the uncertainty and data analysis skills as well. So the Atwood's machine experiment I showed at the beginning was from this study. Um, so that is an example of the traditional lab. And so we took the experiments from the traditional lab and just restructured them. Um, so this is what it looked like in the restructured version. And just as an example, if you remember in the control, the students were told, for example, um, to drop the mass three times and repeat it for seven different pairs of masses. So now in the new version, um, we asked them to think about the sources of uncertainty, how they might reduce the source of uncertainty, um, that they're going to do this for different mass pairs, but then we ask them how many different masses should you use and why. So that's almost directly taking a statement in the previous lab um, and turning them into questions. And then there's a lot of other stuff in here. And so what we wanted to look at was sort of what is the nature of this structure? Um, so we identified 12 what we consider to be productive decisions for planning, executing, and reflecting on their physics experiments. So things like, are the students making predictions, clarifying the assumptions of their uh, models, and are they revising their methods at any point? And so first of all, we looked at the instructions that we gave the students to see whether any of those decisions were cued for the students to make, or if they were actually made for them or provided. So for example, the decision about clarifying assumptions, a cue in the instructions would look like what sort of assumptions about the physical system do these equations make? Whereas um, just providing that decision for them would be, for example, this model assumes that the pivot is frictionless. So the students don't have to decide. Here, we're telling them to decide. The third option is that we don't say anything about it and it's up to the student to do it or not. Okay, um, and so when we look at the lab instructions in the control group, what we find is that when it comes to the planning decisions, a lot of them are made for the students in advance. So the darker gray means that we just gave them the decision. The light gray means we prompted them or cued them to think about it. Um, but there's very little structure um, regarding executing and reflecting the experiment. So they're sort of given the setup told what to do, and then they're sort of left. So they're not prompted or structured to iterate or um, sort of reflect on their methods. In our intervention labs, it's a very different story though. So only one of all of the decisions is actually made for the students in advance. Everything else is cued if it's mentioned at all. Um, if you add up the total number of decisions either prompted um, or given, um, you find that there's actually more structure in the intervention than um, 
in the control condition. But the structure, of course, is very different, and it is different every week. So then we also looked at, you know, what do the students do as a result? So then we looked for in these sort of submitted lab notes that they um, submit to the instructor to be graded, um, which of these decisions do they document in those notes? Um, we didn't look for the number of times they make a similar decision, just whether they made it at some point um, in the lab. We also didn't evaluate for any kind of correctness, if it was a good or bad decision, just are they thinking about these kinds of decisions at all? Um, and then we didn't distinguish whether they were cued or told the decision in the instructions, but we sort of compare to what happened in the instructions after the fact. Um, and so in the control condition, what we find is that on average amongst all of the students, very, they're making very, very few of these decisions in their lab notes. Um, so it really is, they're just sort of documenting their data and that's kind of it. Um, but in the intervention, it's a very different story. So they're making you know, more than three times as many um, decisions as in the control condition, but it's obviously very variable between the weeks, which is interesting. Um, for example, the very first week, which is our pendulum lab, um, they're not making very many decisions, but that changes in the second week, which we think is sort of a shifting expectations and getting them used to sort of what this new kind of lab is. Um, we also um, distinguish the labs as either confirmation or evaluation labs. And so what this means is confirmation, like the ones we've seen before, they're sort of told what the outcome is that they're supposed to get. In most cases, it was to measure um, acceleration due to gravity in this experiment or in this study. And evaluation labs were something that were more open-ended. So the students um, either didn't know what the outcome was or there were a couple possible outcomes that they had to distinguish between. And so we see possibly that the confirmation labs, the students are making fewer decisions in the confirmation labs than in the other ones, but obviously it's very small numbers. So it's intriguing, but not definitive by any means. Separately, we also looked at just the quality of some of their decisions. Um, so one of them was just, do they explore their results at all? So after they get an initial result, do they do any sort of follow-up to sort of probe it deep, more deeply? Um, and what we find is that in the control condition, you know, most, almost all of the students don't explore their results. They just get an answer and then they're done. In the intervention condition, however, we see 40% of them will actually, if they get a result that is ambiguous or it um, conflicts with sort of what they would expect, they do some more digging um, to see what might be going on. 20% of them actually explored results that even just came out as expected. So, you know, they measured G is 9.8 and they kept going. Um, and then sort of this 40% up here that don't do any exploring, which tells us we've got some more work to do. Um, we also looked at whether their conclusions that they write in their notes were supported by their data. And so in the control group, we get about 40% provide conclusions supported by their data and over 50% um, record conclusions that are actually contradicted by their data. And most of the time, this was their conclusions were supported by theory, but their data didn't support that theory. In the intervention group, this number goes way down. Um, but again, we've still got some work to do there. Okay, so our big idea number three is that the structure is not inherently bad. In this study, the um, intervention lab was technically more structured than the control lab, but it was really restructured. And we took what used to be statements like take 10 trials, um, we turned those into questions. How many trials are you gonna take? Um, but we also added a lot of structure for executing and reflecting on the experiment, which is what we think got the students into this habit of exploring their results more. And as a result, the students in the intervention lab made more and better experimentation decisions. Okay, 
So um, I'm from Canada, so I'm going to give us a hockey analogy <laughs> here. Apologies. Um, and the analogy is that, you know, a lot of this, especially regarding structure, I think, um, is not very surprising. And um, if we were to teach a student how to play hockey, we wouldn't just throw them into the NHL. You would start with teaching them how to skate. And you do that by holding their hands, giving them, you know, other things to hold on to, lots of, you know, usually knee pads and a helmet as well, <laughs> so that they don't hurt themselves. Um, and you slow, you know, you do drills and exercises with them um, to get them to sort of learn discrete sort of small skills. But we also often will let them make sure that they're playing a game as well. So every hockey practice and, you know, soccer practice and all kinds of sports, um, you make sure that the students, the kids get a chance to actually play the game and see what it's really like. And that's sort of the analogy that we have for designing our lab instruction. So if we put these two ideas of structure and confirmation on a sort of set of axes, um, you can imagine that the traditional labs are up in this top corner where they're highly structured and confirmatory. Um, and on the other end, you could have what I call anything goes labs. These are completely open-ended, completely unstructured. The students just go into a room with equipment and they get to do whatever they want. Our research is not advocating for that one. <laughs> um, really what we want, right, is some version of, um, you know, Riding, to, riding a bike with training wheels or these sorts of drills and exercises as you learn to skate. Um, but also, you know, giving some opportunities for these kind of very open-ended um, sort of thinking them as, as play. And so there's some kind of trajectory that over in a, a physics course, you might sort of go back and forth between these different pieces. We don't really know what that looks like, um, but we at least know that we don't wanna do the extremes. And so as an example, um, uh, a few examples of the kinds of labs that we've been doing. Um, I've already told you a lot about this pendulum lab. This is usually the first one in our sequence. We have a lot of structure for students making decisions about the experiment, particularly related to finding ways to reduce uncertainty. Um, and it has this nice feature where the students expect it's gonna be a confirmation lab, but we sort of um, confront them with this um, approximation that happens. Um, and so they get to sort of discover this sort of more deep physics related to the quality of their experiment. Later in the semester, we do a Hooke's Law lab, so stretchy things. Um, and we ask them to just identify, bring in stretchy things from home um, and test whether they obey Hooke's Law. So in this case, we give them some structure sort of reminding them to do things like collect some pilot data before they dig into the experiment, um, keep track of sort of their methods um, and ways to reduce uncertainty. But we give them this big choice in what to test and sort of how to test it. And this one's particularly fun because it's not Googleable. So the students in this group, for example, brought in gummy worms and we're trying to figure out um, sort of the spring constant of a gummy worm does it, you know, at what point does it break and what does the, you know, force versus extension look like as it approaches its breaking point? Um, they've done all kinds of stuff. Uh, this group we're testing um, bungee cords, if they have them sort of doubled up versus just one loop. Um, and then this group, when we were, had the remote labs um, in last year, um, the students didn't have any, you know, the sort of set of standard weights that we typically have in our lab rooms. And so they used coins, which have a standard weight, and just counted the number of coins as the force um, pulling on, in this case, just elastic. So um, really fun to see the students getting creative and really thinking outside the box about how are they going to actually make measurements, um, particularly at home. Um, we do an electrostatics lab experiment um, that uses just um, like scotch tape or any kind of sticky tape. And so scotch tape will um, attract itself uh, if it's, you know, if you put it on a table and peel it off, there's some charge transfer. And so um, uh, the students, again, we sort of set it up as we want them to come up with models that explain what's happening now completely qualitative, no um, math or um, numbers. And so the simple answer is very accessible. There's some kind of charge transfer. 
but then you sort of probe them to get deeper with that, you know, where is the charge transferring from, from what thing to the other, and can you design an experiment to test those sorts of hypotheses for what might be happening? Um, you had Eugenia Ekina come and speak a little while ago. She gave a, has a series of wonderful papers about the weird things that LEDs do. Um, so we borrowed from that and set up a lab where students are testing whether resistors, light bulbs, and LEDs are ohmic. And so resistors are nice and sort of confirmatory, um, but light bulbs and LEDs have all kinds of fun, weird behavior. So the students really get to explore and be creative um, with those ones. And then in all of our physics courses, we try to end the semester with a sort of project lab. And we actually even have one of the courses in our sequence is a semester long project. And in each case, the students, it's still very structured, even though it's incredibly open-ended. The students have to write a proposal. Um, it gets reviewed by their peers and by the instructors. Um, they have to submit weekly progress reports that keep track of what they're doing and also who's doing what to make sure that everyone is participating. And then there's a final presentation at the end. And this is a picture from our poster presentation a few years ago. Um, and so this is incredibly up to them, though we do some guidance to make sure that they're not just doing what I think are boring confirmatory um, experiments, but actually asking questions that don't have answers to them. And this is to me the sort of you know playing the game at the end. OK, <clears throat> and so now going to analogy of riding a bike. Um, some of the sort of ideas that I've talked about today um, is are first of all thinking of labs as focusing on experimentation explicitly rather than about teaching physics concepts um, and to really help students develop some important sort of process skills about how we do experiments in physics. To do that, think about restructuring rather than removing structure in labs. So you're still going to provide some information to students about what's going on but let students make some of the decisions about the experiment. Um, we do that by turning statements into questions or cues or prompts. Um, you can also give students choices about what to test and that can really just open up the space a lot. And as much as possible require justification. So when students make a decision, um, make sure that they're thinking about why that's the right decision. Um, and that's the place that you can start to sort of um, reflect later on. And then whenever possible, open up the space so that they really are discovering the way an experimental physicist would. So using experiments where the students and if possible, the instructors don't know the answer, um, which requires sort of a refocus on you know, process over product. So it's not about what answer they get at the end. It's all about how they get there. OK. Um, all of our lab materials are available online at fizport.org. Um, I've already mentioned Eugenia. We lean a lot on the stuff that she's the work that she's done. So I'm linking her website there as well. Um, and while we were still doing remote labs, we leaned a lot on um, cell phones as um, a way for students to collect data. So some of my favorite um, cell phone apps that are free, freely available to students are linked there as well. And with that, I will thank my group again. And hopefully we've got time for some question and answers. Yo quería hacer una pregunta también. Levanto la mano. Eh, Lucas, adelante. No, eh, Daniel levantó, levantó la mano. <coughs> Lucas, eh, adelante. Abrir el micrófono nomás y, y preguntar. Ah, no, como Daniel estaba primero, quería preguntar a él, pero bueno. Este, preguntamos en español y alguien traduce o lo preguntamos en inglés. Como te quede más cómodo, Lucas. Ok. Eh, 
Mi inglés es, es very bad, así que... <ríe> eh, eh, how, eh, hi, Natalia. Eh, quería, quería saber con respecto al, al, a este, a, al examen. Uh, do you evaluate experimental skills on the exam? Quería saber si se evaluaban las habilidades experimentales que desarrollan con, con, con este sistema de, de clase, como para comparar con, con, con el otro sistema. Porque, porque dijo que era, que, era, que era opcional, ¿no? El laboratorio. Y quería saber si en el examen se evaluaba igualmente el laboratorio, ¿no? Eh, un, un segundo, por favor. Andrea o Lucas, eh, creo que cambiaste tu audio, creo que estabas hablando en el canal en inglés, y quienes están en español no te escucharon la pregunta, Lucas. Tú tendrías que quedarte en español, preguntar en español, y le traslada la pregunta eh, a se, se, escuchó, se escuchó, se escuchó en el canal en español, ¿eh? Se yo estoy en español. Ah, bueno. Sí, sí, sí. Sí, se escuchó. Sí. Yo no lo escuché, perdón. No sé en qué canal estoy. Perfecto. Ah, yes. Um, in most of these studies, um, the lab experiment sort of lab skills are not included in the exams. And that's something that we've started changing um, to make sure that they actually get included. Because um, I can imply from your question that that's important if you're going to have these goals in the labs um, to make sure that students get evaluated on them. So we've started injecting lab questions into um, the sort of traditional physics exams. Daniel, creo que seguía, ¿no? Sí, estaba Daniel. Adelante. Ya puedo preguntar. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, este, le, le quisiera agradecer mucho a Natalia por, por el tiempo que nos ha dedicado. Este, creo que es, mucho, es muy importante para nosotros, que como yo nos dedicamos a los laboratorios introductorios, este, conocer su trabajo. Y la pregunta eh, que quería hacerle tiene que ver con el inventario de pensamiento crítico que ustedes han diseñado y han validado, Concretamente, sí, porque no lo encontramos, si ese inventario está traducido al idioma español o eventualmente si se está pensando en su traducción para que se pudiera utilizar en países del habla hispana, digamos. Muchas gracias. Great question. I was contacted a little while ago from someone interested in translating it, but they um, did not follow up afterwards. So I don't know what the status of that is. We have it translated into uh, Mandarin and Finnish right now um, and would love to get a Spanish translation if anyone is interested in taking that project on. Bueno, en principio, en principio no, no sé si podemos hacernos cargo, pero pero en todo caso nos comunicaríamos con ustedes. Eh, Daniel, eh, si, si les interesa, yo encaro ese, ese proyecto. Gracias Javier, gracias Natalia. Cecilia. Eh, bueno, buenos días. Eh, primero, bueno, voy a hablar en español también. Eh, en primer lugar, agradecer a Natalia, me parece que estuvo muy interesante la charla para los que nos dedicamos a, a la física experimental, justamente. Lo mío, más que una pregunta, era ¿no? una reflexión, un comentario. Reflexión que vine haciendo a lo largo de la charla, porque justo nos encontramos en, en todo este proceso de cuestionarnos 
cuál es la mejor forma de, de encarar, no sé si se va haciendo automática la traducción, ¿no? Para, eh, de enfocarnos en estos cursos de experimental, yo trabajo en los cursos introductorios para estudiantes de Facultad de Ingeniería, entonces tenemos del orden de 300 estudiantes en el semestre, divididos en grupos pequeños, y venimos desde hace muchos años haciendo esta transición que tú mencionaste, de los laboratorios donde les decíamos medir 10 veces, y usar 30 centímetros de largo del péndulo, hasta plantearlo en preguntas. Eh, y bueno, y la pandemia de alguna forma o sea, nos obligó a romper con lo que... Siempre, o sea, hacer el cambio que siempre habíamos querido hacer, y no nos animábamos de alguna forma, porque nos parecía que la limitante del tiempo era como algo que nos marcaba y que si les dejábamos mucha libertad, por más que la práctica fuera un péndulo muy sencillo, no se iba a poder. Y en la pandemia surgieron ejemplos como los que tú mostraste, ahí ellos tenían que enviarnos videos con lo que hacían, y se daban esas discusiones, y en prácticas tan simples como una caída libre, mostraban un nivel de reflexión y de cuestionamiento que nos demostró que era posible dar ese paso. Y bueno, y ahora terminó la está terminando la pandemia, y justamente estamos nosotros, como equipos docentes, en, en intentar eh, bueno, rescatar qué de lo que aprendimos en pandemia como docentes podemos tomar. ¿no? Y entonces estamos intentando ahora, en las clases, que también la, lo que hacen es una experiencia de péndulo, como la que tú mencionaste, que el objetivo final es encontrar un valor de aceleración gravitatoria, pero el objetivo central está en todo el proceso, ¿no? Eh, el pasar de decirles, bueno, sí, antes intentábamos decirles, eh, bueno, elijan el largo del péndulo, bueno, ahora los ponemos a discutir, y es más importante toda esa discusión de qué tamaño de, de diámetro van a usar para la masa, qué masa van a usar, si importa, si no importa, eh, que después llegar a un valor de, de G o no. Y algo que nos pusimos ahora es analizar algo similar a lo que tú mencionaste, de cómo se refleja eso en los informes finales que ellos entregan una semana después, y dónde aparece esa reflexión. Y algo que notamos es que en los informes pre-pandemia, digamos, eh, ellos hacían toda la experiencia y cuando llegaban al valor de G y no les daba 9,8, se ponían recién ahí a pensar, bueno, lo que pasa es que había rozamiento, que el hilo no era inextensible, y en la pandemia esa reflexión se da antes de diseñar la experiencia. Entonces me pareció eh, muy interesante la charla porque un poco nos, nos reafirma eh, el camino en el que veníamos. ¿no? Pero un poco eso de, de ver ahora o sea, cosas que hicimos en la pandemia, bueno, nos, nos movió a nosotros también como docentes, nuestra cabeza que, que estaba un poco estática en eso. Perdón que me extendí un poco. Pero... Entonces era eso, una, una reflexión ¿no? como para ver un poco también qué, qué cosas a veces nos atamos como docentes y no nos animamos a, a probar esos cambios. ¿no? That's great to hear. Thank you for sharing that um, reflection with me. I think I'm glad to hear that the pan pandemic actually had some good <laughs> in terms of forcing everyone to think critically about what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, and I think one of the other things that I learned, you know, that I think research supports is for demonstrating concepts, things like simulations are very effective at demonstrating those concepts. And so we really can take advantage of these, this kind of reflection and decision making um, and critically evaluating you know, how we do experiments um, and really making that the focus of the labs. And when students have their hands on the equipment and need to start to be creative, there's so much that they can learn through that process. Bueno, Andrés. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's very, very helpful as usual. And uh, so the question that I have is, is so something that I did like many years ago. And at that time, I was just a PhD student, so I had to teach. And I thought that for the labs, it would be a good idea. And probably this is related to a previous question. I thought it would be a good idea to have an exam in the lab, having the students do an experiment. And that's something that I, I, I'm trying to implement for next year. And uh, I don't, my question is, do you, have you done any study on how good or bad that approach is to actually assess the learning of the students in the laboratory, have them do some experiment that, they, so something that they haven't done in the regular classes in lab, but something that they should be able to know if they 
have understood all they've done in the laboratory. Uh, could you repeat the question? I wasn't hearing it through the right channel. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So yeah, it is uh, it is about evaluation and assessment of experimental skills. Now you you, you mentioned that that's what we something that is important and, and I totally agree. And that's something that we're trying to change our labs here because they're a little bit outdated. And uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do in this uh, is have an exam in the lab, have the students come to the lab and do an experiment, and that be part of of of, of great to see how well they're doing the experiment so i don't and my question is have, do you have any experience of that have you done any research on how good that is if it's a, if that helps them um if it motivates them to look at exactly that those tiny little things that in every experiment are going to make a difference or not so yeah you have any research on that as far as i know there is no research on that um and it's, uh, you know, I think at a lot of institutions, when you have hundreds of students in these courses, logistically, it is so challenging <laughs> to figure out just how to do that because, you know, do you want them working in groups or working alone and grading it is such a mess. Um, and so unfortunately, I don't know of any research that has looked at the quality of these hands on um, lab exams. And I think it is a really important next step for physics education research to start digging into what will that look like um, and how do we know if these exams are, are good. Um, one of the things that we've often relied on is students' lab notes. So they document um, on paper sort of what they're doing and all this data analysis, et cetera. Um, but there's often a question of, you know, it, are we just then evaluating their writing as opposed to their actual technical practical skills and i i also don't really know how to disentangle that other than having like one-on-one -on -one, um, exams with an instructor who's watching the process but practically with hundreds of students we just can't do it so i think it's a really it's a really big challenge um, for physics instructors and education researchers to figure out how to do that next Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Muy bien. Sigue Claudio. Hola, buen día. Este, bueno, quería agradecerle a Natalia también por esta charla muy interesante. Y eh, quería, eh, quería saber si eh, puede ser que Natalia haya sugerido, eh, siguiendo con el ejemplo del péndulo, ¿no? que me parece que es muy gráfico, plantear, eh, antes de realizar la experiencia, la física detrás del péndulo, por ejemplo, pero no llegar a dar explícitamente la ecuación que eh, nos muestra la dependencia de, del periodo con el largo y, y la masa y nada más. Eh, y que ellos exploren mediante la experiencia si depende, por ejemplo, del ángulo o no. ¿Se entiende medio lo que quería decir? O sea, no llegar a darles todo, porque ¿qué hago yo? Yo desarrollo la matemática y la física detrás del péndulo y le digo, bueno, y el periodo tiene esta dependencia. Eh, y claro, es cierto, porque después cuando hacen las medidas, miden para un dado ángulo y, ven, eh, y determina el periodo, pero después, este, ¿para qué van a medir otro ángulo si saben que dan, da lo mismo? Siempre en, en, este, en, eh, en ángulos pequeños, ¿no? Perdón, me corrijo, no depende de la masa, depende de este. Eh, gracias, Natalia. Yeah, I think that's a, a good question. And we've struggled a lot with students' um, motivation in this experiment. As you say, they sort of assume the outcome at the beginning. And so they think that this is kind of silly when we force them to really um, probe deeper and deeper until they sort of have this, this realization later on. And so um, I think, you know, the Hooke's Law example that I gave is much more in line with what you're suggesting, just sort of a, we know that this is Hooke's Law and let's leave it up to you to figure out what you want to investigate there. Um, we think that there is, I think that there is a benefit 
to this experiment in terms of this it's a little bit more structured it's a little bit more contained and we explicitly um, confront students with this idea of confirmation and so it gets them out of the habit that they've had um, in their other um, labs um, sort of in high school and things to um, realize that this there's a new game that we're playing here and in my experience sort of that very explicit confronting with this new idea um, is sort of easier than if we were to just give them something more open-ended and give them a, a lot more choice they're sort of I don't know that they're ready for that right away um, so to me the pendulum is sort of an easing in um, of that open-endedness but again we don't actually know what the best path is. And so we should be doing the experiments um, as education researchers to really figure out what is the best um, sort of structure. We know the traditional lab isn't good. We don't really know what's better. Hey, gracias, Natasha. Thank you, Natasha. Muy bien, Erika. Buenos días, ¿me escuchan? Perfecto. Ay, muy buenos días a todos. Ante todo, felicitarles por esta presentación muy, muy interesante. Una buena iniciativa de, de los profesores de Uruguay. Eh, yo soy de República Dominicana. Eh, varios de mis compañeros que quisieron estar presentes y van a estar accediendo al video más adelante. Eh, quería preguntar de, con respecto a la, al conocimiento previo que traen los estudiantes, por ejemplo, a una clase de laboratorio. Eh, la maestra Natasha indicó que es vital ese conocimiento previo porque puede definir todo su aprendizaje a lo largo del periodo académico, o sea, de, de esa asignatura. Entonces, eh, nosotros, por ejemplo, a veces tenemos una estructura muy apretada con respecto a, a, un a una asignatura en un periodo dado y no nos da mucho como la flexibilidad de nosotros hacer esas evaluaciones de conocimientos previos para poder utilizar ciertas estrategias metodológicas que me ayuden a mejorar esa, ese, el, o sea, esa forma de aprender del joven. O sea, más o menos cuando ustedes tienen esa problemática, ¿cómo ustedes, o sea, qué estrategias le han sido más efectivas para, para resolver esa situación? Yes, that's a, um, you know, can, dealing with all of the learning goals um, and expectations is certainly very difficult. And, we have benefited in the university structure that labs are usually this separate, you know, dedicated time um, that we can really play with, but that's not always the case in every type of course. Um, and so one sort of thought, you know, I think the, the first study is sort of demonstrating that labs, the hands-on parts aren't really adding to students' conceptual understanding, um, means that you can sort of take that hands-on time and just restructure that piece sort of separately. So maintaining, you know, all of the other kinds of activities um, that exist for developing students, you know, conceptual knowledge, but then taking as, you know, as, as much free time as you have um, just to let students do more of this kind of open um, experiments. And so in our labs, for example, because we don't expect students to come away with any sort of conceptual physics knowledge, we used to have eight different experiments in one semester. And so we cut that number in half and now they only do about four, but they spend two weeks on each lab. Um, and that's again, sort of tied to this understanding that the, the hands-on part is really just about developing these experimentation skills rather than um, the concept. So it's thinking of them as separate learning goals um, and separate time spent on each of those goals. I know that that's not really helpful in terms of dealing with the practicalities, um, but it's sort of a slightly different frame um, way of thinking about how the time is spent. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. 
Nicolás, adelante. Buenos días a todos. Eh, mi consulta iba por la siguiente experiencia, tanto como estudiante como como docente. El tema es, ¿cómo han lidiado con el hecho de que el estudiante quizás al enfrentarse a un aula tan abierta, con poca estructura, donde eh, buscamos que ellos transiten por una etapa de descubrimiento, eh, el estudiante pueda haber agarrado entre una sesión y otra de clase, eh, querer buscar en internet, por ejemplo, eh, estructuras más estables y decir, bueno, ta, como yo no sé cómo hacer esto, no me doy cuenta cómo hacer esto, eh, voy a internet y busco un protocolo clásico, bien, y, y llevo a clase eso y digo, bueno, ta, creo que es así porque lo vi así. ¿Les ha sucedido? ¿Cómo han lidiado con eso? Great question. Um, surprisingly, very little of this um, sort of searching for the answer happens in our labs. And we think it is, particularly we, when we get to something like the Hooke's Law Lab, um, you know, it's hard to look up on the internet, how do I measure the spring constant of a gummy worm or whatever it may be. And so by, we have sort of found that by Um, offering students more choice and sort of control of the experiment. They're more excited to, they're more motivated um, to do the thinking themselves. Um, and for whatever reason, there's very little sort of looking up at for finding an answer um, on, the, on the computer because they're excited to do the experiment themselves, I, I think. Um, and one example of this is, you know, we have 27 lab sessions that take place at different times throughout the week. And the students on Friday are just as clueless as the students on Monday about the angle dependence of the pendulum. So they're not even talking to each other, let alone um, looking up answers on the internet. And I think there is some kind of just tapping into human motivation that we really take advantage of here. Um, not to mention that we also just constrain them to two hours, right? That they've got to be done and, and move on. <laughs> Um, to their other classes. So um, it's always been surprising just how little they look up um, on the internet. Muchas gracias. Bueno, entonces agradecemos nuevamente. Muchísimas gracias, Natalia. Quisiera, no sé, si pudiéramos abrir los micrófonos y brindarle un aplauso a Natalia, un aplauso sonoro, sería tal vez muy cálido. Claro. Gracias, Natalia. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Excellent. Thank you.